Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, uh, our last day of DEF CON, congratulations on surviving. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be talking about uh, famous and not so famous unsolved codes. So I am Ilanka Dunin, and I am a game developer and a crypto authority and a book author and Hello, I'm Klaus Schmee. I'm a German IT security expert, uh, crypto expert, crypto history expert, and book author. Right. And together we wrote a couple books, uh, one of which is Code Breaking, a practical guide, which I believe is sold out at the uh, in, in the vendor hall right now. They might have like one copy left. And uh, it came out in September of last year. So we're going to be going through a very small number of unsolved encrypted messages, uh, starting with one of my favorites, Cryptos. This is uh, Langley, Virginia, uh, CIA headquarters. And uh, that white building with the funny shaped roof is the cafeteria. And outside the windows of the cafeteria, there is a green landscaped area with a sculpture called Cryptos. It was um, uh, co uh, commissioned in 1988, uh, installed in 1990, and it has an encrypted inscription on it. And there are four parts. Um, so the sculpture was there is Jim Sanborn, and the designer of the ciphers on it is Ed Scheidt. I've met uh, both of them. Uh, Jim uh, Sanborn, no public list of his works really existed until I started making one around 2003, and then he kind of called me up and he said, uh, who are you and why do you have a web page about me? <laughs> and uh, I explained that I was a big fan, and, and now we're uh, we're getting along much better. And Ed Scheidt, uh, also he's listed as the retired chairman of a CIA cryptographic center. There is no CIA cryptographic center, but uh, he is a uh, he's a spook. Okay, he's been involved <laughs> with the CIA for a long time. So the inscription, I won't go into great detail about how these are made. We kind of number them K1 through K4, uh, and uh, we've solved the first three parts. The fourth part has not been solved yet. So it is one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. And uh, Sam Warren has actually given us some clues uh, about it. He uh, gave us the clue that uh, and in 2010, that at, starting at the 64th character there, is the word Berlin. And after that, we have the word clock. So there's been a lot of research done on clocks in Berlin. And then in January 2020, he gave us another clue, the word Northeast. And then the pandemic started, and he kind of wanted to stir things up, and so he gave another clue, which is the word East. So it's kind of embarrassing now because we have a big chunk of what is supposedly the deciphered text, and we still don't know what it says. So uh, uh, Cryptos, I should also mention, is a big part of a book by Dan Brown, who wrote the book The Da Vinci Code, in uh, 2003, which and this uh, sequel, The Lost Symbol, takes place in Washington, D.C., published in 2009, and it does feature both cryptos and Freemasons as recurring themes. And in the book, there is a character named Nola K., which he put in there, he named after me. Uh, so uh, it's a, sort of a scrambled version of my name there because I helped him with some of the research for the book. So, why hasn't K4 been solved yet? Well, it's short. It's just 97 characters, uh, so it's very difficult. Uh, there may be a key that is only access accessible on CIA grounds. We might have missed something. We might have been misdirected, and uh, it, he may have messed it up. There might be a mistake that makes it unsolvable. So, um we have it on our list here as an unsolved crypto mystery. Okay, let's now come to the next crypto mystery, the so-called DeBosnis cryptograms. Well, this story takes us to the year 1882, and it takes place in New York State. 
Well, uh, honestly, there are not many uh, pictures uh, about this story, so I created a couple of pictures myself. I used Lego uh, for it, so the, the story takes place in Essex County, New York, and in the year 1882, a stranger came to this place. His name was Henry de Bosnis, and after only a few weeks, he started courting a widow who lived uh, in this area. Her name was Elizabeth Wells. And after only a few weeks later, the two married. So all this went pretty fast. And it was all already Henry de Bosnis' uh, third marriage. Uh, his first two wives had died pretty early after the wedding. Now uh, he had found a third wife, but again, the, uh, the marriage didn't last very long because after only about five weeks or so, his wife was found dead. She was both uh, stabbed and shot. And uh, well, it's no wonder that Henry de Bosnitz became the prime suspect. And all, uh, all the events I told you about took place within a very short time frame. On May the 1st, Henry de Bosnitz came to Essex County only five weeks later he married and uh, seven weeks later his wife was murdered. And as I said, Henry de Bosnitz became the prime suspect. He was arrested, put into jail. And uh, while he was in jail, he, uh, well, he wrote a couple of poems, a couple of other texts. Uh, he drew a few pictures. Uh, apparently he was quite good at uh, things like that. He knew a lot about literature. He, he spoke several languages and uh, he also was a good artist. And in addition, he created a couple of encrypted messages. I will come back to this later. Well, then he was uh, put on trial. The trial started on January 20th, 1883. It ended with a verdict. Uh, he was condemned to death on April 16th. And uh, well, there's an interesting story about this. Uh, before he died or before he went to execution, uh, he sold his body to a local physician uh, who could use it for scientific experiments. And with the money he gained, uh, he bought himself a suit so he, uh, he could die in a nice suit and apparently that was important to him. Well, he was hanged and uh, as you can see here, he was hanged in his uh, nice suit he had purchased uh, with the money he had made. And uh, that was on April 27th, 1883. And somehow, well, as I said, he sold his, his body to a physician and somehow his skull finally made it uh, to a local museum, the Adirondack History Center Museum. And there it can be seen along with the hangman's rope that was used. Well, uh, this is certainly an interesting case with a couple of open questions. Uh, for example, uh, the first question, of course, is was Henry de Bosnitz really guilty? Well, he probably was. He always uh, denied uh, being the murderer of his wife, but apparently there was uh, enough evidence to uh, find him guilty. Well, as I said, his first two wives pride, uh, died pretty early too. So the question is, of course, did he murder them too? We don't know. And uh, who was he anyway? Because while on uh, trial, he said, well, I'm not really Henry de Bosnitz. This is only a pseudonym. I'm somebody else. Uh, this is not my true identity. Uh, this might have been a lie, but uh, it, it was not really clear who he really was and uh, his background was not really clear. So there are a couple of questions and uh, maybe these questions could be answered if it was possible to uh, decipher the encrypted messages he created in jail. Well, altogether, he created four messages for cryptograms. Uh, as you see here, uh, he also added a couple of uh, drawings and uh, as you can also see, these uh, messages contain a lot of different uh, letters. So the, the alphabet he used was uh, pretty large and we have no clue what uh, is written in these notes. De Bosnitz, he spoke several languages, English, French, Portuguese, Latin, Greek. So it's not even clear which plain text language he used. 
Of course, when one tries to solve uh, an encrypted message of this kind, it's always a good idea to look for crypts. And in this case, there is a potential crypt because uh, what you see here is a poem the Bosnians wrote while in jail. And this looks pretty similar as one of his encrypted messages. So maybe there's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, if this really is the case, it would be, it would, would go a long way in solving uh, the mystery. But so far, nobody has really managed to, to, uh, to match uh, the, uh, the two texts and to, to make sense of it. So maybe it is not a crypt or maybe uh, the, the correct way to, to use this script hasn't been found yet. So the message is still undeciphered. And so we are dealing with an unsolved, or more or less unsolved criminal case. And it's also an unsolved crypto mystery. So next we're going to go to uh, something that I find super interesting. This is from World War II. A pigeon, a carrier pigeon, was found in the chimney of someone in Surrey in England. Uh, he found it in 1982, uh, brought it to public attention in, in 2012. So um, we think that the pigeon was on its way to RAF Bomber Command in High Wycombe there, and uh, the, the, ch the pigeon carried an encrypted message. So carrier pigeons, very briefly, in World War II were used extensively. Uh, there were uh, over 250,000 that were being used, and there was even a special metal that was created for particularly brave brave pigeons, such as ones that uh, took a, an injury and still managed to get to their destination. Uh, this was a medal that was also given to other animals, dogs, horses, uh, and even some cats received it. So here's the message. It was in, the, and that's actually the, the leg of the pigeon, and a red canister there. Uh, red canisters tended to be used either by the United States forces or by the British Army. And uh, th there's the uh, code 2, which we know was RAF Bomber Command in High Wycombe. And these are the identifiers of the two pigeons. This was a message that was sent in duplicate. Uh, the uh, NURP there, N-U-R-P, meant National Union of Racing Pigeons. And then the uh, 40 and 37 were the years that these particular pigeon pigeons were banded. Uh, then these were probably the, the homes of the pigeons where they were hatched and raised. And then their number in that particular year. So uh, the TW probably means either Twickenham or Tunbridge Wells, and uh, the DK probably means Dorking. Uh, also, we have, so the, of the numbers there, uh, there's the number six, which would have been the day of the month, which would tie in with D-Day, June 6, 1944. Uh, the time that the form was filled in, the time uh, that the message was created, and the number of copies sent. So this section was in different handwriting, was probably filled in by someone else, probably someone in France, as opposed to uh, uh, someone who is English, and that would tie in with that word uh, LIB, which would mean libéré, the, the pigeon was freed at that particular time at 425. And it was sent by a Sergeant Stott. And uh, if research shows that there was a Sergeant William Stott. He was 27 years old, a paratrooper, and did parachute into occupied Normandy on a reconnaissance mission on D-Day. So this was uh, probably him sending a message back to home after that. Now, of this message, there are 27 groups of letters, five letters each. And we also know that this uh, A-O-A-K-N appears twice, both at the beginning and at the end. So what kind of a sy system might have been used? Well, there's several. It might have been a manual cipher, might have been a code book or an encryption machine or a one-time pad. Uh, there's several kinds of machines that were used in World War II around the time. So uh, 
we don't know. And so it is one of the unsolved mysteries. Yes, and uh, let's now look at another unsolved crypto mystery. Uh, this one takes us to my home country, to Germany. Uh, to be more precise, it takes us to Thuringia, which is today one of the 16 states of uh, Germany. And a, a couple of years ago, uh, a blog reader of mine contacted me and he said, well, I, my family is from Thuringia and for generations we have possessed a cigarette case. And uh, this cigarette case, well, first of all, it's, it, it uh, bears this uh, two letter uh, engravement here. These letters stand for AS, but this is not the important part. In addition, it contains a dedication, which uh, was probably uh, engraved here, uh, probably not by a, a professional, but by uh, maybe by the person who, who gave, uh, used this uh, secret case as a gift, uh, as a present for somebody. And uh, apparently this dedication is encrypted. Uh, you can see it here. We have four lines of uh, unknown symbols. We have no idea how this can be read, how this can be deciphered. At least it's clear uh, that the date mentioned here is Christmas Eve, the 24th of December in 1909. And uh, in Germany, in my home country, uh, Christmas presents are usually given on Christmas Eve. So I'm my... Uh, suspicion is that this uh, secret case was a Christmas present for somebody. And uh, of course, as I already mentioned, uh, when trying to break such an encryption, it's always good to look for grips. And if this really was a Christmas present, uh, it seems possible that something like uh, Merry Christmas or in German Frohe Weihnachten is included. But uh, this grip, uh, if it is one, hasn't helped so far. I, I can't find anything here that looks like Frohe Weihnachten. So, in, in my view, the whole uh, the, the whole cryptogram is pretty strange. Oh, no, well, first of all, it's not strange at all, because there are many encryptions that look like this. Um, here you have a few, uh, on the right side, you have a few en en encrypted texts from the same time, and I think the similarity is obvious. Uh, these encrypted texts from the right side are from encrypted postcards and it would be no problem to add a hundred more here. This is the kind of encryption that was used by people who uh, wrote encrypted postcards or maybe encrypted letters a hundred years ago. And almost all of these encryptions can be broken very easily today. So this dedication is an absolutely uh, an absolute exception because it looks like all the encryptions from uh, this time but contrary to almost all others, we have no idea how it can be deciphered. So it's something that looks easy, but appears to be very difficult. Uh, if you have an idea on how this can be broken, uh, let us know. But uh, so far, this is an unsolved crypto mystery. So here's one when we talk about famous and not so famous. This is one of the famous ones, the Dorabella cryptogram uh, from Worcester. And it was created by the composer Edward Elgar, who uh, is most famous for uh, a piece called uh, Pomp and Circumstance that you've probably heard at graduation ceremonies. He had uh, an interest in puzzles and even wrote something called the Enigma Variations with 14 different sections, each one that was dedicated to a different person. And one of them was a young woman named Dora Penny, who uh, frequently accompanied his family as they traveled around. She was one of his companions. And she later wrote an autobiography called uh, Memories of a Variation. And at one point when his family was staying with her family and his mother sent a thank you note and he included a small note of his own to Dora and it was in code. 
This was in 1897, and uh, she was not able to decrypt it and later printed it in her autobiography, right, and said, if anyone can solve it, I would most appreciate it if, if you could tell me what it says. Uh, but uh, no one was able to. And here it is uh, well over 100 years later. We still don't know what it says. Uh, it looks like a simple substitution cipher. Uh, now, Elgar did write other encrypted messages. We have access to his notes. And, uh, you know, some of them are alphabetical and very similar symbols. But uh, applying them to the Dorabell cryptogram does not really give us anything. So if we take uh, that alphabet and apply it, we get something that is not intelligible. And if we uh, try doing other methods of frequency analysis, uh, that is not intelligible either. Uh, we've done frequency analysis and uh, said, well, you know, maybe this one is, uh, you know, the, the highest frequency one is the letter E and haven't come up with anything there either. Uh, we've done other methods. We could, you know, just guessing words, which is difficult because it doesn't really have spaces between the words. And uh, we've tried a, a technique called hill climbing, uh, but has not come up with anything. The best it has is like now droop beige uh, weeds. So that doesn't seem helpful. And uh, so why do these methods fail? Well, maybe it's not a substitution cipher. Maybe it's some other method entirely, Morse code or something. Maybe these things are meant to indicate musical notes uh, or, or something musical. Uh, maybe he made a mistake. Maybe he wrote it when he wasn't feeling well or inebriated or something. And so maybe there's a mistake. And maybe it was never intended to mean anything which is unlikely. I mean, she was a friend and, um, you know, th there's no reason that he would have uh, sent her a, a fraudulent message. And maybe the plain text can't be solved because it doesn't have the patterns of English. For example, there's a sentence, do you go to London tomorrow, which would be very difficult to solve. It doesn't have any ease in it. It doesn't match the normal frequencies. So this remains an unsolved message. Let's now come to the next one. Uh, this is again one of the not so famous uh, cipher mysteries. You won't find this one in, uh, in the collection you find on YouTube or in, in the books that have been published. So this is something not very famous, but very interesting. Well, first of all, uh, let's talk about encrypted postcards. Uh, about a hundred years ago, in the early 19th, uh, 20th century, uh, encrypted postcards were very popular. Uh, there are literally hundreds of them. I know several people who collect encrypted postcards and I've seen large collections. I've seen series of uh, encrypted postcards. The longest ones are something like 200 postcards written back and forth between, usually between lovers. I think 90% of the encrypted postcards I've seen are from uh, men to their lovers. So apparently, uh, or they, they were, they contained the love messages. So apparently love messages were encrypted quite often a hundred years ago. And uh, here, here you see two examples. It would be no problem to show many more. Here are uh, two more encrypted postcards. And most of these encrypted postcards are not very difficult to solve. Uh, well, this one is especially easy. If you uh, read it backwards, you get uh, you darling. Of course, most others are not that easy, but still uh, foreign experienced code breakers. It's not really a challenge usually. Uh, for example, this one, uh, this encrypted message uh, con consists of numbers from one to 25, I, I think. So, Probably every every number stands for a letter, and in fact, uh, with uh, some frequency analysis and some word guessing, it's not very difficult to find the substitution table. 
And uh, there's one complication. Uh, this message is written from right to left, but that's easy to get because, uh, as you see, it's uh, um, a straight line on the right side. So uh, if you look at it, it, it's a good guess to to assume that it's written from right to left. And again, it's a love message. Baby, I wanted to talk to you so bad. I'm so sorry you did not have time and so on. Uh, this is very typical. Most of the encrypted postcards we have looked at uh, have a message of this kind. So as I said, most of the postcards, almost all of them uh, are solved. But there's one, this one exception, which is almost driving me mad because I, I really have absolutely no idea what to do with this postcard. Well, first of all, it's the oldest one. I know it's from 1873. All other encrypted postcards I've seen so far uh, were written at a later point of time. And well, this is uh, the front side. As you can see here, it was written to a certain Lizzie Furlong in uh, uh, she lived actually near uh, Luton, and this is the rear side. Uh, here is the message written to this Lizzie. Mm, it was written from Luton, and the sender was a certain George Furlong. And uh, in fact, it was the great great grandson of George Furlong, who today lives in Canada, who informed me about this postcard. Uh, it's in family position for generation, and he has absolutely no clue what this message means. He sent it to me and he was hoping I could decipher it or my blog readers could decipher it. But uh, in fact, uh, nobody was successful. Well, uh, if you look at this um, text here, it, it looks different from almost all other encrypted postcards. Well, first of all, uh, apparently the writer was fluent. So my guess would be that uh, it's by far not the first time that this person wrote in this script. And this is unusual. Most other postcards look not, not, not like the writer was so fluent. And then some of the letters are not, uh, in, in, or uh, not all of the letters are in one line, which is also unusual. I, I don't know if these additional letters uh, are meant as a correction or if it's, uh, if from the beginning it was supposed to look this way. I have no idea. Um, usually frequency analysis is a good tool to start uh, analyzing such an encrypted message. But in this case, frequency analysis is really different because the, it's sometimes different to distinguish between the symbols. So um, this doesn't help very much. Of course, looking for grips is always a good idea. and. Well, my guess would be that this is a month, but uh, I don't know which one and uh, I, I don't know how to make sense of it. This uh, is probably the name of the recipient, which would be Lizzie. But uh, can you make Lizzie out of these uh, letters? Uh, I can't. And finally, uh, here's an underlined word at the top. It's probably not a place because the place Luton is mentioned in the clear. Uh, Basically, I have no idea what it is. So if, if you uh, would know what would be written at the top of such a message, uh, please let me know. Okay, so I, I have looked at many uh, hypotheses of what all this could, could be about. And so far, the best one in my view I found is uh, that it's a phonetic script. Well, um, as we all know, in the English language, it happens quite often that letter combinations or that the same let letter combination is pronounced in a different way or sometimes several letters uh, stand for one uh, sound or sometimes uh, some, some uh, letters are not pronounced at all. And for this reason, in the 19th century, there were linguists who tried to create phonetic scripts. A phonetic script uh, is a script where every um, every letter corresponds uh, to to one uh, uh, to one sound of the language, and here on the right you see a few examples: the Shaw alphabet, the Desiree alphabet, and the Quickscript alphabet. I think there is a certain similarity, and I wouldn't be surprised if this message uh, had been written in a phonetic script too. But so far, I didn't find a phonetic script that looks like this. So. Uh, seems like a, a good theory, but so far it has uh, proven to be a dead end. 
Well, let's um, finally, uh, this is uh, the cover of our book. And uh, as you can see here, the um, uh, Furlong postcard is one of our favorite unsolved uh, crypto mysteries. And this is why we even mention it or we, we even used it on the cover of our book. Uh, so the lines you see here are from the Furlong postcard. So maybe someday somebody will see the cover of the book and we will Im immediately recognize, well, this is the so-and-so script. And he will tell us uh, how all this works. But uh, so far, this hasn't happened. Again, we are dealing with an unsolved crypto mystery. Thank you. So now we're going to talk about uh, something that it surely is solvable, which is called Encrypt. And it's from south of the equator in Canberra, where a, uh, a science museum has a science educator who created this sculpture. You might call it the Southern Cryptos, uh, but he called it Encrypt. Right, and for the uh, uh, anniversary, one of the Canberra founding anniversaries in 2013, uh, he created the sculpture. Right, and this is uh, Glenn McIntosh, who's probably one of the number one fans of Encrypt and has a website with lots of information about it. So Encrypt uh, comprises eight pillars. And on these pillars, there are cryptograms of different types. We know that there are at least 16 there, about six of which are solved. Uh, here is an example of one on pillar C. The, the rings there that you see on the pillar can be turned. So it, it's, it's clearly indicating something relating to Enigma and the rotors on the Enigma machine. And so you can map out how the different letters uh, are connected to each other. And this is one that is solved, that is on pillar B. And it uses, uh, so with this narrower portion of pillar B, it's as though you could wrap something around it with a very specific diameter. And this is indicating an old system called a scatale, where you would uh, wrap a, a piece of leather or papyrus around some sort of a, a wooden uh, stick and write the message and then unwrap it and send it. And the receiver would have to have a stick of the exact same diameter in order to be able to read the message. Uh, and this is the message from pillar B. All right. And here's pillar H, one of the ones that is still unsolved. And if you look at the different letters that are on this metallic pillar, you'll see that certain of the letters, specifically P, L and V are a little bit larger than the other letters. We don't know why. Uh, we've talked to the artist and he has told us that all of the different puzzles together are connected and some need to be solved before others. And that this particular one is one that will have to wait till towards the end before it can be solved. All right. And altogether, there are several unsolved crypto mysteries. Okay, so this is the last chapter now. We are going to look at a few more crypto mysteries in brief now. For example, uh, this is a mystery we found on a Russian website. Um, this takes us to Kaliningrad, which is uh, today a city in Russia. It used to be German until the end of the Second World War. Uh, the, the name was Königsberg. And uh, near Kaliningrad, uh, there's a place or a town named Baltisk. And according to this Russian website we found a couple of years ago, uh, something was found in Baltisk. It was a bottle post. Well, as you can see here, uh, this uh, place is not on the seashore or it is not near water. So it's certainly unusual to find a bottle post there. But it happened uh, next to this house. In 2015, a bottle post was found here. 
Mm. And this is, uh, we, we don't have a uh, picture of the bottle, but we have uh, pictures, a picture of the message. It's uh, the front side and the rear side. And um, we don't know what this message says. And it's also completely unclear what uh, the purpose or the background of this message is. Mm. Our estimation is that it's from the 1950s, more or less, or maybe a little later, maybe a little earlier. And of course, it could be a Cold War dead drop. Maybe it was a message written by a spy or for a spy with an encryption system used by secret services. And uh, maybe somebody put this uh, bottle with this message somewhere there for a spy to pick it up would be a possibility. Of course, it would be a spectacular possibility. Maybe it's also, it could also be a toy created by a couple of children or something like that. You, you never know. Of course, it would be interesting uh, to, to know what uh, the message says, but so far it's an unsolved crypto mystery. Um, here's a completely different one, but also very interesting. Uh, the man here is Ignatius Polacki, a private detective from London in the 19th century. He was one of the first private detectives known in history, and some people call him the real Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's pretty clear that uh, when, when Arthur Conan Doyle wrote his Sherlock Holmes stories a few decades later, he clearly uh, had Polacki and maybe a few other real detectives in his mind. Uh, so he, uh, Polacki certainly influenced uh, the, the criminal literature of the times. And uh, contrary to Sherlock Holmes, um, Ignatius Polacki published encrypted newspaper advertisements in the Times. We actually don't know how many he published, but we know about five or six that contain his name. There might be many more because usually if you uh, uh, publish a secret message or an encrypted message, you don't mention your name, but uh, in some cases he ab um, apparently did. Uh, this one is a more a code message. Turkeys are in gangs, eagles fly alone. We have no idea what this sentence means and it will be pretty difficult to find out. Uh, here we have a few more and these are not uh, code messages, but really encrypted messages, cipher messages. Um, you see in all of these messages, the name Polacki is mentioned, uh, sometimes including the address. And honestly, we have no clue how these messages can be deciphered. So Polacki might have used a code book. So it could be uh, possible to decipher the messages if we find the code book he used. Uh, but it looks difficult because even if he used a code book, he might have used uh, super encryptions or an additional encryption. Um, very difficult. So uh, these are clearly uh, unsolved crypto mysteries, but very hard one. Or if you look at the lower one, he uses symbols. Uh, I've never seen uh, symbols like these before. And uh, in my view, they are pretty complicated uh, to, to encrypt something. You, you don't need symbols of this kind, especially if you want to print this in a newspaper. So I have absolutely no idea why he used these symbols and um, why, uh, what they mean, and uh, all of them are different. So frequency analysis doesn't help very much, or almost all are different. There, there's uh, there one repetition. So frequency analysis doesn't help. Um, we have no idea what all this is about. And finally, a list of uh, unsolved crypto, crypto mysteries would be incomplete without the famous Voynich manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is a handwritten book from the 15th century, probably. It was handmade, so it was handwritten. The drawings were made by hand. It has 230 pages and over 200 uh, illustrations. And um, the remarkable thing about the Voynich Manuscript is that it's written in a script nobody knows and nobody can read. So we have 230 pages filled with this writing. And of course, there have been dozens of uh, analyses of all kind, but uh, this has led nowhere so far. So this is a really, um, really fascinating and really hard crypto mystery. And of course, uh, the question is, um, 
is it solvable at all? It, it could also be a hoax. It could be an encrypted text. It's also possible that an ordinary encryption, uh, an ordinary writing system was used, but that this writing system is lost now. Basically, we have no idea. Uh, I think every year two or three new uh, solutions are published, but uh, so far, uh, I think 70 solutions also can be found on the internet. But uh, in my view, everything is crap so far. And I'm, I'm not the only one who uh, thinks this way. Okay, so it's another unsolved Chris crypto mystery and certainly a very uh, famous one. So, in conclusion, uh, there are lots of unsolved messages out there. Uh, if you would like to help with any of these, uh, a site that we recommend is Mystery Twister. And they have hundreds of different challenges. Some are solved, some are not solved. And you can go in there and you can sort them by what you want. If you want something easy to cut your teeth on, go to a level one cipher. And if you want one of the unsolved messages or one of the very uh, difficult ones, go for a level X. And thank you. Thank you. We have 17 more minutes for questions. Are there any? Yeah. And uh, again, congratulations to everyone on surviving DEF CON thus far. Uh, just a little bit more to go. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yes. Yes. Back there. Uh, well, uh, we did a book signing on Friday, and of course, uh, we, we are welcome. Uh, you're welcome to come here, and we will sign uh, any books. Uh, yeah, no problem. We also have some book plates uh, with our autographs on them. If someone doesn't have a book, okay. Yes. Uh, Repeat the question. Uh, the question was, uh, during our research, if we also uh, solved any crypto mysteries. Uh, well, definitely. Well, uh, honestly, uh, we are more uh, the people who talk about it. We are not the, the uh, great code breakers, but of course, many of uh, the um, uh, many of the cryptograms uh, that can that are found are solved. Uh, I had a blog introducing unsolved crypto mysteries um, twice a week or three times a week. And most of the um, cryptograms I introduced were, read, uh, were solved by my blog readers pretty soon. For example, encrypted postcards. I at least published a hundred encrypted postcards on my blogs, and I think 99% were solved, except for this only one. <laughs> so it's uh, in many cases it's not even very difficult. In, in some cases it's very difficult. So there are very good code breakers around, and in some cases, but uh, that's the exception. No solution is found. Yeah, I, I mean I solved. Uh, probably the biggest one is the Cyrillic projector. Uh, this is uh, also created by Jim Sanborn. And uh, this is a, a cylinder which is currently at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. And it, all the letters are in the Cyrillic language. And I, I didn't do it alone. It was part of a team. But uh, that's probably the most famous one. Yeah. Yes? Okay, so if I have understood the question correctly, uh, you ask uh, how to start. If, if you have an, an encrypted text, you don't know what it is, how to start. Okay, well, um, there, there, uh, usually you start by... Well, first of all, you need background information. So if you get an encrypted text, you always look uh, who might have created it, which languages did this person speak, where, uh, when was he created. This is important uh, background information. And then uh, you usually uh, apply statistics. So you do a frequency count of the letters, frequency count of the letter pairs, of the letter triplets, of the word lengths, and things like that. Uh, very often this tells you... Um, where, where to go or what kind of uh, encryption system might have been used. And uh, word guessing is also um, sometimes a, a very helpful tool. 
So, yes, and um, maybe in a couple of years, uh, there will be AI tools who can do this part of the job. I know people who work on this uh, question and maybe in a couple of years, uh, you feed such a message to an AI tool and it will at least tell you, well, this looks like a, a substitution cipher or this looks like a transposition cipher. And maybe it will even be uh, capable of breaking yeah. the cipher. Yeah, some years in the future and, you know, Captain Picard, computer, please solve the Voynich manuscript, right? Okay, yeah, <laughs> you can ask. Well, I prob I don't think that this will be successful, but we will see. Yes? Could be uh, uh, the the question was if uh, the the encrypted postcard could be something like a pig pen cipher. Uh, the pig pen cipher was a very popular cipher for centuries. It's also named the Freemason cipher because the Freemasons used it, but others used it as well. Um, I, I I wouldn't know how to match uh, these letters of this message with the Freemason cipher or with the pig pen cipher, but. Maybe that's something uh, we, we could look at again. Who knows? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different ways to slice and dice it. Uh, yes. If you have an idea, by all means, have at it. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, one thing might be important to note: uh, the spaces uh, that can be seen here are uh, added by us, so there are no spaces in the original. It's just to yeah. to make uh, the thing better readable. Yeah. Yeah. Put it in groups of five up to the end of the line, and then start the next line with groups of five. Yeah. Sure. No. Any all, other? All the help we can get. Yes. I can't hear him. Uh, sorry, I. Uh, Uh, you mean uh, that this uh, message here that it was created with a, um, a system that uh, includes a key and without the key it's not possible? Uh, well, uh, this, this kind of system uh, this, uh, was available at that time, uh, at the end of the 19th century, so it's uh, certainly possible. The question is if Edward Elgar uh, used such a system to write a message to a friend uh, who apparently had no uh, clue about cryptography. But it it's uh, so it certainly would have been possible to use a system that is not uh, breakable today. Okay. Yes. You mean a language? Uh, you, you mean a cipher and a writing system? How do we tell if we're dealing with a language or a cipher? Great question. Well, uh, from a cryptographic point of view, a writing system and a simple substitution cipher are the same. So you can use uh, the same methods to, to break them. So um, if, if simply other letters are used, uh, it can be regarded as an encryption, although uh, it was not really meant to be an encryption. It was uh, simply uh, used, uh, simply another system was used. Uh, if the encryption is more complicated, you usually see this um, when you look at the statistics. For example, well, in, in English, uh, the E is the most uh, frequent letter with a frequency of about uh, how, how many? 12 or 40? 12, 12 percent. 12, 12 percent. 20. And if, if the distribution looks more even, you know that it's not a simple substitution cipher and not an unknown writing system. It must be something else, either a good or a better encryption system or, or maybe random data or whatever. Yeah, sometimes it's difficult to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. I so, think. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank then you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions. <laughs>